problem. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you are watching. My name is Maggie Cavanaugh. I am your host of Keys to Your Best Life. And today I have Christy Neal with you. Christy is an amazing speaker, author, podcaster, mother, you name it. She's the real deal, the whole package. I absolutely love her. So Christy, welcome to the show. Oh, welcome. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Those kind words. I appreciate that, Maggie. Well, listen, I appreciate you. And I, you know, I said before the broadcast, something that I really appreciate about you is that you speak the truth with love. And you are able to talk about some topics that some people are just really not comfortable talking about. Yes. So for those of you, of you that do not know Christy, I will put her bio in the chat stream, but she is the founder of Choose Different Ministries because she understands the impact of a wrong choice. That's and she is the author of an amazing book that is the second edition is coming out in February. So why don't we talk a little bit about the book for a moment here, Christy, and sure. let them know. Yeah, sure. So don't ever tell the, the first edition has been out for four years. Um, and basically, it was not my idea to write this book. <laughs> I, I actually did not want to write the book. I'm not a big reader. And so the thought of me writing was kind of comical. But God just kept nudging my spirit you know how he does when he wants you to do something, he keeps nudging you, nudging you. And finally I was like, okay, I will write this silly book, prove to you that no one is going to read this goofy thing, you know, because I was divorced. Um, my marriage didn't survive uh, my affair. And so I had had an affair in my church with a married man, a uh, very, very ugly situation. And so fast forward here, I was a single divorced working mother when God was calling me to, to write the book. And so um, long story short, it took me four years to write it. It was excruciating reliving all the stupid selfish choices that I had made. Um, but people did read it. And I found that, wow, this was needed. And even though my first marriage didn't survive, I was still able to be a voice of hope for Christian women and men that had been affected by adultery. And so it's been awesome to watch God, you know, um, return all of these testimonies on how the book touched them in so many different ways than, than I could have, have fathomed. I love that. You know, I, my life scripture is Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So even though this, this very difficult season that you were in, you know, caught in the, in, in, in adultery, you know, and then coming out of it, God used that to help other people so that when they start to see the signs or when they start to see the slippery slope, if you will, and I know I've heard you speak, um, and I know how it was a slippery slope and every Everything starts in the mind. So share with the audience a little bit about what you went through, the mindset, because you were the perfect Christian girl. You know, you had it, you know, the whole package. And, you know, so for those of you watching, you know, sometimes you think that, you know, you're so good, this can't happen to you, or you're so bad that it deserves to happen to you, or this is the way you should be. But I want you to really take heed and take a listen to Christy's story, because it is powerful how God, even though the enemy tempted her, how God intervened. And I just love that. So you want to share this out with your friends, colleagues, anyone that you think might need a word of encouragement. Maybe you have uh, been caught in adultery. Maybe you're the spouse of someone who has committed adultery. But listen, this story can touch the hearts of many. So Christy, why don't you share with them a little bit about what you went through? Sure, sure. Well, we, I had lived a double life for about two and a half years. And so what started out as something as just a season of fun, which was kind of the thought pattern that, that was my slippery slope. And uh, like you mentioned, you know, I really had that perfect Southern girl, you know, track record of all the do-do's as a Christian and none of the don't do's. So I, you know, I didn't sleep around before I got married. Um, I didn't do drugs. I had never been drunk. I didn't even smoke cigarettes. You know, uh, my mom had taught us not to gossip, you know, so I did my darndest to, to only say good things, you know, about people. And so I found my first husband at a Christian university. So we had that perfect, you know, storybook, quote unquote, Christian beginning. Uh, he was also a virgin when we married. 
So I think for us, I would say the first um, slippery slope step was we felt secure in our own performance. Mm. We had this false sense of security in our perfect Christian performance. And it was kind of like we arrived at marriage, you know, unpregnant, you know, not addicted to any drugs or, or alcohol and let the blessings of life flow, you know. And my first husband and I were married almost 10 years. But wow. as the years went on, we never maintained our marriage. It was more like a trophy, you know, that, that we had earned and we would stop and look at it and like, oh, look at our marriage. We did so good, you know, pat ourselves on the back. And, you know, I say in my book, we didn't even take the time to dust it. And so we didn't maintain our gift. Um, and for me, I began staying home with our daughter after we were married for five years. Uh, previously to that, I was a professional in the working environment. I had a degree in communications and marketing. I loved working. I loved people. I loved being the best at whatever I was doing. So when we decided to keep our daughter home, it was this shift in, oh my goodness, I don't have an identity because no one was giving out awards for clean laundry, you know, clean diapers, <laughs> clean okay. bathrooms. And they should. Okay. I'm, they should. They should. I'm telling you, and I've had this idea of creating choose different trophies for stay-at-home moms <laughs> because you know, everything you do as a stay-at-home mom literally gets undone in a matter of 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. So it's this mundane, you know, cycle. So for me, one day in my laundry room, um, my daughter was in a season of just blowing through anything we put on her, bless her heart. I mean, just huge explosions. <laughs> and so every day I found myself scrubbing feces out of her onesies and she was little goodness. She was probably only like two months old, three months old. And so I was in the laundry room on a Saturday scrubbing feces out of her clothes. And all of a sudden this thought came to me, oh my goodness, it's Saturday. Here I am in this laundry room doing the exact same thing I do. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll probably be doing this tomorrow. I don't have a weekend anymore. And all of a sudden it was like the weight of the world on my shoulders as a new mom. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Mm -hmm. And then this little voice came to me. You work so hard. You're such a good mom. And I was, that got my attention, you know, sure. So no one was telling me I was doing a, a excellent job really. And it's like, you work so hard to keep the house clean, take care of your husband, take care of your grams. What do you do for yourself? And I remember I paused and I sat, you know, her onesie down for a second over the washing machine. I was like, what do I do for myself? And then, it, and then this thought, you deserve a season of fun. Just a season. Something for you. The Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a That's season. Right. That's Ooh, right. And girl. so for me, a young mom, I was 28 at the time. I really thought these were my own thoughts. And I remember agreeing, you know what? I do deserve some fun, just something for me. I am a good mom. And then I went about doing my laundry, didn't think anything else about it. Well, over the course of the next six, eight months, I would have these thoughts come back to me. And little did I know, every time I agreed with them, I was literally agreeing with a seed of temptation yes. planted by the devil, but I didn't know that at the time. Sure. Um, fast forward, you know, six or eight months, and I met someone fun, fun at church. And because he was at church and I was at church, and I had agreed I, des I deserved a season of fun, just right. a season, um, I really justified my way into a very strong friendship and then from there hugging and then from there a couple months later a kiss then from there a couple months later I was in a full-fledged affair and it truly I always say this no one ever wakes up one morning and says you know I think I'll have an affair today I think I'll ruin my family and my reputation right it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way and I will say to this to anyone who's been cheated on, I loved my husband dearly. I adored my daughter. I loved our family. I loved God. It wasn't like he had done, he, it wasn't like he deserved it or I was, you know, vengeful or, or anything like that. Um, it was more me just following in, you know, to this plan that the devil had for me. 
What is that up? I mean, you know, when you say the seeds of temptation, it is so true because that's how it happens, you know? Yes. That's why we have to take our thoughts captive and it just, and that watering of it and so forth and knowing, and it sounds justifiable because we all know that self-care is important. So who wouldn't stop and think, yeah, I need to do something for myself. However, yes. that was a whole different ball of wax than having a mani petty, you know? Right. <laughs> so, right. wow. Wow. Yeah. And it started out as innocent. Um, I sold Mary Kay at the time and he bought Mary Kay from me for his wife. I didn't even know. I knew his wife. I didn't know him. And so from there, we started emailing over the Mary Kay order. Well, next thing I know, he had sent a joke. It made me laugh. I was like, this guy's so funny. And then we started emailing back and forth every once in a while. And it became like this secret friendship that was kind of fun because it was like, no one at church even knows that we're good friends. Mm -hmm. Almost like when you're in school. Right. You know? And so I would say, never say never. That's, that's one of my big slogans. Because for me, I justified myself right into a relationship with this married man by saying, I would never, you know, do anything to hurt my family. I'm a good Christian. I love the Lord. I love my family, you know. Uh, but I deserve some fun. So it's okay to send this email. You know, I would never, ever make out with another woman's husband. That's crazy, right. you know, but I deserve some fun. So it's okay to go running with this group of people. And he happens to be in the group. You see, and you see what I mean? And then it would be, oh, people can't come this time. And only him and I can run together. And well, that's okay. We're good friends. And, and he goes to church and loves God. And I go to church. We would never do anything. And it's slowly, you see what I'm saying? Sure. One day he just hugged me, you know, nonchalantly, but it felt so good. And my flesh was like, oh, oh, right. I deserve some, a season of fun, just a season. So it's, it's so looking back, it sounds weird, but it was innocent, but I justified it right into something that was horrific and terrible. And, and there was no justification for it. Uh, which I always say, wow. and we didn't get caught. We, we decided to tell the truth. Both of us the same night. Yeah. We told, um, our spouses the exact same night and we really hoped that it would kind of, you know, snap us out of this fantasy land, um, and bring us back to, okay, we are going to be, we are missing out on our families. We're going to lose our families. Um, and then from there, it just kind of all hit the fan when people in the church found out it was just, it was a mess. So Greg, before we go on, I want to piggyback on something you said about how it was so gradual and so innocent because, you know, and this is why we really have to guard ourselves because we yeah. never know whenever there's going to be a moment of temptation where we're weak and, and give in to that and the flesh will respond. The flesh yeah. will respond. And it, you know, so it can happen to anybody at any time. And, you know, yeah. so whenever you were talking about that, that, um, that gradual effect or the slow fade, so to speak, or the slippery slope, you know, it reminds me of the story of the frogs whenever they make frog legs, how they put them yeah. into the pot and they're, they're content with the water. And then it starts to heat up and they're being boiled and they don't even know it. Yes. And they don't have a sense to jump out because it's already just like that. It happened. Yeah. That's and I, out this time. Guilty. guilty. And my pastor just this past Sunday was talking about our conscience is really there to protect us. And I thought it was very interesting. He said, your conscience will scream at you at first. Mm -hmm. And Maggie, I have to tell you the very first time that I noticed this man really looking at me and women, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I know. The first yeah. time he was really looking at me and we caught eyes in my spirit. And I'm not joking. You, it said trouble. Yep. I heard it clear as day trouble, but I didn't listen. And so what my, pastor, spirit. Yeah, what my pastor talked about was your conscience will scream at first. If yep. you don't listen, it will talk to you. Mm. If you don't listen, it will whisper to you. If you don't listen, eventually you won't hear it. That's and right. that's exactly what led me into living a double life, which was so full of lies at every turn because I had silenced my conscience, mm. you know, and my gut feeling that was like, run, this is trouble, you know. It's so easy for people to fall into temptation. And then unfortunately, you know, people around us respond. How did the church respond to you? Oh, um, 
you know, I always want to be very respectful because sure. there are wonderful, wonderful people at, at the church that we were at. However, for us, we were literally in shock at how quickly they turned. Um, for me, it was like automatically I was, uh, it was like I had leprosy. I was this home wrecker and, you know, terrible things were being said about me. I remember someone saying, she's been after our husbands, you know, ever since she's been here, which was so far from the truth, you know, and very painful, very painful. And so there was lots of labeling, lots of judging. People stopped uh, looking at me. Like if they saw me, they would look away. Um, I had people run from me. I'm not joking. Um, it was never, you know, said, Christy Neal, don't come back to this church. But it was known. I was not welcomed back. I literally had to go around to people's homes that we were close to just so I could tell my side of the story. Um, I went to our Sunday school leaders home and just asked if I could talk to the Sunday school class. And they said that was not a good idea. Um, my husband at the time was begging the elders to reach out to me. You know, he knew I was, I was in a dark place. I was lost. Yes. Um, you know, if you are in the middle of your spouse cheating on you, they are lost. They are not themselves. They are right. consumed by the flesh, consumed by anger. Uh, I felt like all of a sudden everybody blamed me and it was all my fault. Um, and unfortunately still in many church settings, it's still blamed on the woman. Oh, yeah. you know, I, I where do. the funny thing is the man in the, in my affair was telling the church, I pursued her. I pursued her, but it was still blamed on me. It was very interesting. And, you know, I, I never, Hey, I took complete ownership of my own choices, Sure, you know, and he took complete ownership of his own choices. But what we, what we noticed was interesting. My first husband and I, they surrounded the man took him to coffee, you know, brother, we understand we've all been there. You know, I used to be addicted to porn, people sharing their stories. But for me, I was ostracized, um, persecuted. And my husband was also persecuted and my best friend. Um, they, she was actually told that they would um, disfellowship from her. They could not support her continuing to be a friend of mine. Uh, it was so, so sorry. heartbreaking, you know, that is tragic. It's okay. I brought that on myself, you know, looking back and, and I'm not saying poor me, poor me, you know, I mean, I brought that into my life, but it was more of this shock that, oh my gosh, there's no plan for us. No one wants to help us. No one cares how we got here. And so I think that what hurt me the most, Maggie, was I, I had been there for six years. My husband and I were very involved. I taught um, kids classes. We went to the, the marriage retreats. We went to the Sunday school classes. Uh, we had a home church group. What bothered me was no one sat me down and, and everybody loved Christy Neal, you know, before this came out and I was like the perfect little Christian mom and wife, everybody loved me. And they were like, Oh, we love Christy Neal. She's so honest. We need more Christy Neal's, you know, she tells it how it is. And then when I came out with my truth, no one wanted to hear from me. And so I just found it very interesting that there, there is no plan here. And this had happened multiple times before with other couples in this church. And so it was alarming to me, the drastic difference, how the woman was treated versus how the man was treated. And I knew my heart. I knew I was a good woman. I knew I was a good wife. I knew I wasn't a whore. I'd only been with two men, you know? Right. And so all of these things compiled makes you so angry as the sinner. Yes. yes. And, and I'm sitting here thinking, you people don't know the half of it. You only know I had an affair. I know all the dirty details. I know every place I've been. I know every place I've done it. You see what I'm saying? Right. And so we have to be so careful as believers to not cast judgment and labels. Amen. We have to be careful with our looks because literally I mentor women now who refuse to step foot in another church building. 
you know, this is a huge epidemic, a yes. huge epidemic. With yes. this is where we go for our help, and this is where accountability comes in. Amen. And so, on the man's side, they came in, and you know, brother, we're going to hold you accountable. How can we help you? We're going to pray through this, but to not have a support system or a plan in place for those who fall through the cracks, because I am a huge advocate. And listen, y'all that are watching, we are not bashing the church. We are no. talking about imperfected. Imperf imperfect people in an imperfect world in a church gathering setting. We are the church, the body of Christ right here, right now discussing this topic. But I yes. wish to see that more people did understand and have great protocol because I've seen similar situations whenever it comes to addictions and different ways and so forth. And they need the love and support. So if you are in a church and someone is not able to hold you accountable and say, look, you made a mistake. You've repented. Let's see how we can get past this. I mean, you know, that's why our ministry is moving forward ministries because so many people get stuck, but yeah. it really, it causes more damage. And then it people does. start to look at the church and with the, through the eyes of their pain, because it was a painful experience. And yeah. we're telling you all that Jesus will heal you where you're hurt. So, I mean, oh my goodness. So how did you get past it? Obviously you and your husband had to go for outside support because you were not getting it in the local church. Yes. And I will say the question that I just wish someone had asked me was Christy Neal, how did you even get to this place where you would consider doing something so out of the ordinary for your character? So that is such a good question to ask, you know, anyone that has come out with a new truth that seems to be shocking to you as a friend or as a church organization, th that means that you know the true character of this person and the sin action that they have been in or are in is not a reflection of who they are. That's um, right. So I had one individual and I talk about her in my book. She has a whole chapter uh, and her name is Sierra. And she came to me in the church hall and she was one of two women that came to me um, out of all the ladies that I knew in the church, outside of my best friend. And she said to me, I'll never forget, I am so mad at you. She pulled me aside. I'm so mad at you. I love you. I think she said, I love you first. So that was good. You know, I love you. I'm so mad at you. You know, I can't believe what you've done. I don't understand it. I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. But I want you to know I'm praying for you. And I love you. And I'm not sure when I'll talk to you again because I'm processing all this, but I will talk to you again. That was the best gift. She, it was like, she was Jesus for me in that moment yes. because I knew, you know, what I had done and there was no justification for it. But I have to say, she gave me hope Maggie, because I thought, oh, okay, this friend is disappointed. So that means she expected more out of me, which means she believes in me which means there could be other people here that believe in me. They just haven't put a voice to it. Right. And so for me, that was huge. My first husband and I did seek um, outside help and outside counsel, counsel. We tried to find other churches to fit into. And looking back, you know, if you are a, a pastor or a leader in a church organization, for us, if we would have just been able to be plugged into another church that could have ministered to us, Sure. or did have a couple that had survived adultery where the woman had stepped out, it would have changed our lives. Sure. And that's really all you need to do. If, you, if your church isn't tooled, then just help plug them in to somewhere that is. And yeah. there's plenty of churches in this Nashville Bible Belt area that, that are prepared. Um, but basically, you know, all the things that we tried over about a year and a half, nothing took. Um, I just was so angry and so bitter, resentful that everything had been blamed on me. And my husband, two years prior to the affair, I had tried to beg, I was begging him to go to counseling with me. I knew we had problems um, and he just didn't believe in counseling. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I felt like I had been going to all these counselors trying to fix our marriage by, ourself, by myself, which doesn't work. Right. And then here I was, you know, I stepped out, so it's all my fault. Mm -hmm. And um, so we ended up divorced, but we were still very good friends. Um, to this day, we're still very good friends. Good. There was no lack of love there, sure. you know, which I think people need to know. It's like, just because you've been cheated on does not mean your spouse does not love you. Right. And looking back, truly, it was a lot of my own, you know, inner child and family dynamic demons that were rearing their ugly head in my marriage. 
sure. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, my husband's fault, I guess, you know, cause a lot of women blame themselves when their husband cheats on them. What did I do? It's not you. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most of the time it's the slippery slope, you know, and it's internal demons and negative self beliefs, you yeah. know, that we believe about ourselves. That's true. So, yeah. So I just really, Maggie, I dove into the word, um, for the first time in my life, I started researching and I had to ask myself, okay, I didn't know if I wanted to go back to church. They had hurt me so deeply. I didn't trust church people. I will be honest. I still have trouble trusting church people. I'll be honest. I think most of us have been walking for the Lord longer than five years have that issue. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Maybe and, five minutes for some. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> it's okay. I just want people to know, you know, I go to a church. I love my church now, sure. but, but I still have that little bit of hesitancy and sure. it's fully trusting, um, people and church people. And that's okay. And, um, but for me, I was invited to joy church, which was something completely out of my wheelhouse. I was raised very conservatively in the church of Christ. So people raising their hands, you know, and, ah, and clapping was just really weird. You know, I was like, Oh my gosh, these people are cocoa for cocoa puffs. But something kept drawing me back there. Yes. I was like, these people are way too happy and this is going on way too long, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but the spirit kept drawing me back there. And the, the pastor folk, I love, I love this. He said, God gave you a windshield, a huge windshield in a tiny little rear view mirror for a reason. That's right. Come he's on. like, you focus on the future. You stop focusing yes. on the past. Yes. And he said, you can't unring that bell. You can't unscramble that egg. And this was the biggest thing for me, Maggie. He would tell, tell us over and over and over again in the congregation, God is not mad at you. Yes. He's madly in love with you. Amen. God is not surprised by what you did or where you are. You were surprised. And I was surprised that I had done that. I couldn't believe it. It felt like an out of body experience, you know, looking back. Like it was someone else. Yes, yes. Yeah, like I was, you know, completely someone else. And so that started my faith journey and my journey to healing because I started researching and reading the word for myself, not because my parents told me that God existed, you know, not because it was a routine to go to church every Sunday, but I had to ask myself, do I really believe in this Jesus guy? You know? And so one Sunday, and it took me a long, long time to like myself again, to truly forgive myself. And I tell my ladies, it took me seven years because they always ask the number one question, when will I like myself again? Mm. Will I ever like myself again? And I said, yes, you will. Absolutely. You will love yourself again. Uh, for me, it took seven years, but for my ladies, it can take a year, year and a half. That's right. Because they have some supporting them. Yeah. during the process. That's it's right. huge. It's huge. It's like when you break a bone and they put you in a cast and that support is holding you in place while you're growing new bone. It's the yeah. same thing. Whenever we sin, when we fall, whenever we screw up, if someone is there and grabs a hold of us and puts that cast on us and says, look, it's going to be hard and it's going to be painful, but you don't have to go through what I've gone through. That's right. That's right. And I tell them that. I'm like, if I had a Christy Neal, oh my goodness, that would have been probably, you know, two or three years. Yeah, because I'm why <laughs> the ministry is so important because yeah. many times people get stuck. And I love the analogy. And I've heard about Joy Church. It's one of those churches that I would go to if I lived out there. Um, yes. it's <laughs> awesome. It's awesome. But I love the analogy of the window and the rear view mirror because yeah. that is what the Lord showed me. You know, I, by degree, I'm a counselor and, and, but I do more coaching than counseling because coaching takes you, yes, we're going to deal with your past and move on. And you're going to be focusing on going forward rather than digging up the past. And, and there's a time and a place to deal with the root issues right out the gate. You deal with that with counseling, but then get you some good coaching from someone like Christy, someone who has been through it and has an authority in the spirit and recognizes and knows and has empathy for how you feel. So if you are a woman or a man that are out there and you're thinking, it's too late for me, I screwed up, I didn't want to have this affair, but I did, and now I've hurt myself and everyone I love, there is hope for you. And yeah. you will find it in her book and her, that I'm excited about the new publisher picking Thank this up. You. Thank you. I'm telling you, so God, 
has continually blows my mind, blows my mind. Because I will share of all the lies that I had, you know, coming at me just constantly. Um, and as you know, sinners, if you're out there, you know, and you're in the middle of it, you know, you're hearing constantly, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I've screwed everything up, I've screwed my family up, I've screwed my life up, I've screwed my kids' life up. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. You know, you're in good company with me. You know, I always tell people, how ugly. That's the ugliest thing I can think of, you know, is that I had this affair with this married man in my church. But yet, even that, God has taken it and given me beauty for my ashes. Amen. I mean, it's, I've gone from a hot mess to a hot bless. And it's because <laughs> just I stood on Romans 8, 28 myself so many times. Yeah. And I stood on Jeremiah 29, 11. Because yeah. I didn't know how this was going to turn out. I just had to cling to God's promise. For I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord, plans yes. to give you a hope and a future, yes. not to harm you. You know, and I felt like I was being harmed, but I had to rely on those words. And then I remember choosing um, Nehemiah 8.10, the mm. joy of the Lord is my strength, because yes. I had to rebuild myself. It wasn't the joy of my perfect past anymore, or my perfect reputation as a Christian. It wasn't the joy of my perfect little family or the, the, the children I was going to get to have, I messed that up. I got to have one biological child because of my affair and I was heartbroken. And, but I had to remember, it's not the joy of all these earthly things, right? It's the joy of the Lord. That's my strength. Amen. It's Amen. not the joy of what I've done or what I haven't done. And so I would just say it over and over and over. And for me, there was a lot of anxiety because I stayed in the same town where um, the church was and the affair was. I kept my daughter in that preschool at that church because that's what she loved. And how could I pull her out of that place that she loved because of what I had done? Sure, sure. So I would have to put my big girl pants on, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday and go in and out of that building. But I would remind myself, you know, I'm going to let God lift my chin. Yes. yes and yes. I would just lift my chin and let God lift my chin every time I had to go in there. And it helped me tremendously. And so this verse, I said it over and over and over and over to calm myself. Um, I didn't like taking medicine. I didn't want to be on any kind of antidepressants or anxiety pills. I'm not saying that that's not okay to do. It's just my personal preference. Right. And so I memorized Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, bring your requests before the Lord your God, the peace of God, the peace that makes no sense, you know, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So for me, I would just repeat it over, and I was a runner, so I would repeat it over and over and over until I would calm myself down. And so if you're walking through something, it's the perfect verse that's so fitting, especially in today's time, so much anxiety, you know. You but, know, applying the scriptures like that is how we get free. I used to have to have scriptures on my dashboard of my car. Yeah. You know, and just and on the mirror in the bathroom. I mean, I had to completely rewire my mind. So this resonates with me so much. My yeah. goodness, Christy, this is so powerful. And I hope you all are getting this in and getting this out to other people to hear because it's so important for you to understand, okay, you screwed up repentance is for today and yeah. tomorrow can be as bright as you choose to allow it to be. And I love the name, uh, you know, choose differently because, you know, yeah. given the fact and, you know, Christy, I definitely, I want to have you back because there oh. is a topic that I want to undo uh, in front of so many people. And you are the perfect example uh -huh. of our identity being caught up in the church rather than in who we are in Christ. Yeah. And who, and what I had done. Yeah. yeah. And I would say, I would say for me, because I would hear people say, you know, repent and, you know, turn back to God and everything will be fine. And that scared me because as an addict to this sexual relationship, Maggie, I didn't repent overnight. Right. I'm right. not going to sit here and say and that it was, was a cold turkey yeah. situation. <laughs> right. I, I was divorced and on my own. And sometimes I still slept with this guy because guess what? In my mind, I was like, I'm a whore. I'm a loser. It doesn't right. matter. Yeah, and you had a soul yeah. tie too. Yeah, and I would see men walk by and be like, well, I might as well sleep with him. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, thank God I didn't do that. But I'm just saying for anyone that's listening, and maybe you're in the middle of an affair, and, you know, and you're hearing us talk about repentance, that was not a cold turkey decision. Sure. That was a process. Yes. You know, so be gentle with yourself. 
you know, you didn't just fall into this situation overnight. You're not just going to fall out of it. That's overnight. exactly right. It is a process. It is healing. It is, you know, because, yes. you know, and, and that's why you got to dive into the word because like yes. I said, she went and got scripture to stand on because the Bible tells us that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. But when you're in the mud, right, you know, like if you're in the mud and you've got the voices of the enemy of guilt and condemnation and shame, they will press you down. And that's where depression comes from is to depress and push you down. And, you know, listen, we're here today to tell you there's hope. Yeah. And uh, so that's why you need to get this book. The new edition is coming out in, in February, right? February 2021. I'm so excited. And basically what it tells is the rest of the story. So my book is written like, it reads like um, a novel, but it's my memoir. And so it kind of shows where is my first husband now? Did he get remarried? You know, who did he remarry? Did I ever remarry? You know, what are our lives look like now? And my daughter who was five when we divorced is now 16. And so one of the biggest questions that I get is how do I tell my kids? Do I tell my kids what I've done? And absolutely, you communicate with your children. Uh, because I just want to share real quickly, my father committed adultery on my mother. My mother's father committed adultery on my grandmother. This was in my family. Generational and, iniquity. Yes. And so mentally, I knew that I knew that I knew I was never going to do that. I will never do that. I knew the devastation. Down judgment. Yes, of adultery. But my father never talked to me about how he fell into that sin. Mm -hmm. He never taught me the red flags. Um, neither did my grandfather. I have talked to my daughter, you know, at age appropriate um, with my counselor conversations. When she was younger, it was your father and I love each other, but we get along better under two roofs when she was five and six, you know, then when she hit around 10, mommy made some bad choices. Right. You know, I didn't go into the details. Right. Um, then when she was older, she started asking her questions. And then when she was ready, I, I told her and I'll never forget. Uh, and I just feel moved to share this. I'm sorry if we're going no. long. No, go. go. So, this many good. People, so many people ask me what, you know, do I tell my kids? So I'll share with you what my, what happened with my daughter. She was about 11. Her dad was getting remarried soon. And she started asking some questions. And she asked why we weren't together and I had to tell her. I explained it like this. When mommy and daddy were married, mommy had a boyfriend and that's not okay. And I hurt daddy very bad. And she said to me, Maggie, and I'll never forget, you didn't know mommy, you didn't do anything wrong. And I had to tell her, girly, I did. I did, I did do something wrong you know, and I knew better. And so I just gently talked to her about that. And I told her how sorry I was and that her dad didn't deserve that and that she didn't deserve that, you know, but God has had forgiven me. But I had to be honest with her, Maggie, because that opened the door for future conversations now that she's 16. Yes. About how I fell into that sin. She knows the red flags. That's right. She knows how much I loved her father. It wasn't a, a matter of love or not love. It's the devil's tricky. We're in a fallen world and there's lots of stupid people running around here. <laughs> so exactly right. um, I, I'm a huge advocate for communicating because I fully believe, and I know that I know that she will not fall for that sin. That's right. Because it's been exposed. Oh, that's so important, Christy. I'm glad that you shared that because it is important that we are open with our kids because when they don't have all of the pieces to the puzzle, vain imaginations come in and start that's to right. laugh. And the fact that you can tell by her response, you know, uh, of, well, you didn't do anything wrong. The culture today would say, it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. You know? And so yeah. we know from a, a, for those of us that are Christ followers, those who, who, of us who adhere to the word of God, and we know the difference. And yes, because we fall and skin our knees, you know, the Lord doesn't say bad, bad, you know, Christian, you know, he says, no, you know, come to me if you're heavy and laden and I will give you rest. I mean, he gives us all these things. Like, I love the fact that you, you put up your chin, you know, because outside of the musical Annie, and I love the part, I just put up my chin and grin. <laughs> outside of that part, I love the scripture that says that he is the lifter of our head. Yes. 
And yeah. so, and Christy is so powerful, you know, that what the enemy meant for harm, God turned around for good. And yeah. I just hope that you guys will check her out on her podcast because she has a podcast going on and it's like everyone has a voice. Yeah. Everyone so, has a voice. Yes. And yeah. this whole basis real quick is I was silenced by my sin for the first time in my life. And I mean, I'm a communicator, right? My degree what? is in communication. <laughs> and so I remember thinking, oh my goodness, the devil has me right where he wants me silenced. So when I came out with my book, it was like, oh, I have my voice again. Oh, it felt so good. And then God gave me the vision of the podcast to help other people use their voice around what they've walked through. Because once you share it and use it to help other people, it's like, okay, it is well with my soul. Yeah. It is well with my soul that I endured that or lost that or walked through that persecution or whatever it might be because I'm helping other people with it. And so it's people with these amazing comeback stories. Um, just, you know, I get to interview them and it's just awesome. So check us on iTunes. It's on every Ooh. podcast platform, Spotify. I love it. And we'll put all of that in the chat stream after this airs Friday. And, and Christy, I just want to thank you. I love that, uh, uh, that you are so transparent and it's helping others. And I remember the day I met you. The day I met you was at Swimmer and you come strutting in. I was like, she is so cute. And when you <laughs> walked up there and you said your book had just came out, you know, when you said the title of your book, I was like, oh, go, go. <laughs> I prayed for you right then. I was like, oh, real. Yeah. You know, and you could, hear, you could hear a pin drop in the room. <laughs> yeah. I was, like, I was like, whoa. I, I think I might have went, yeah, or something. I don't know. But I'm telling you, um, people, it gives people permission to be real when we are transparent and we are yeah. not living in this, like, people are imperfect. And we make mistakes, but God is just and faithful and he is right there to hold us together. So Christy, if I was to ask you to leave the audience with a key, what yes. would that key be? I think the key is God is not surprised hmm. and God is not mad at you because whether or not you're on the receiving end or the doing end, people feel like God is mad at them. Like, why did this happen to me? What did I do wrong that God allowed this in my life? And then, you know, if you're the sinner, like God hates me now, you know, oh my gosh, I don't deserve anything good ever in my life. So for me, I just felt like, how could God bless me? How could God use me now to do good for his kingdom uh, after I had done such an ugly thing? But what's amazing, Maggie, is he knew all along. And I've just watched his masterpiece unfold, you know, in, in his perfect timing and so just keep looking to God, keep searching for those handful of scriptures that you can memorize and speak them out loud. I wasn't raised to speak scripture out loud. I didn't know the power, but the word tells us that the living, the word is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. And so that is what you have to do. You have to speak life over yourself. Amen. Um, and for me, the, the key verse for me, and I'll share it real quick was Romans 8, 11, and I was at my kitchen table searching the word in my little house. I guess it had been six years after my affair. I was still just guilt-ridden, shame-ridden, in bondage, and all of a sudden, I read Romans 8, 11, you know, and I was just reading, same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, and, was, you know, and then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, wait a minute, and it was like, it was like Rhema, you know, where it leaps off the pages. It's called Rhema, and it was like highlighted, and I read it out loud, and then I was like, wait a minute. If the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead yes. Come on. is in me, yes. I can't go around with my hung head low anymore. This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I had to ask myself, do I really believe this? Do I really believe this guy named Jesus came, you know, 2,000 years ago and died for me on a tree? And I was like, yes, I do. I do believe this. Hallelujah. And from that day forward, I refused to hang my head in shame. Because anything that anyone harbors against you, Maggie, or against your, the listeners, that's between them and the Lord. That's right. You let that go. The Lord will deal with them. Amen. Because we are free indeed. Anyone, you know, anyone in the sunset's free is free indeed. And so it changed my life. Oh. So. 
I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank and you. for those of you watching, I want you to check out her book. I want you to check out her podcast because there is so much more to the stories that Christy has and you need to hear those because the stories of redemption, of power, and So Christy, thank you so much. Viewers, make sure you like and share this with everyone. And have a blessed day.